Hello everybody, happy Wednesday, happy 3D day, happy Rocket Lasso Live day, and happy St. Patrick's Day. I hope everyone is doing well. We've got people showing up in the chat already. How is everyone doing? How about a big shout out of where everybody is at today? Why not? That's always fun. The... Um, so obviously I'm in Chicago. I'm originally from New York, about an hour out from New York City. But we moved to Illinois when I was eight years old. And I've lived within an hour of Chicago ever since I was eight years old. Um, and I don't have a single drop of Irish blood. <laughs> lots of mixed European blood. Lots of German and English, mostly. But uh, how is everyone doing? Very well, I hope. Uh, where is... Where is Darmstrad? Uh, burned? Is that the burned I think it is? Welcome, welcome. Uh, where do we got? We got Sweden, Atlanta, Toronto, Brooklyn, New York. Uh, Maple, Ontario. Welcome. Uh, uh, the, the pointy bit of Southwest England. Very nice. Um, let's see, do, 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 do. and we got St. Louis, Hamburg, Germany, another Brooklyn, LA, another Berlin. Wow, lots of people from Germany hanging out. Excellent. Um, but yeah, thanks everybody for coming and hanging out. Um, a couple things to point out news-wise. Well, first of all, I, I, this is a regularly scheduled stream, but Maxon is also live streaming right now. And when I'm done streaming, if you want to, you should definitely head over to C4D Live and check out whatever they've got going on. Um, I haven't posted about this yet, but I'm going to be speaking at the Maxon April show. So like the middle of the month in April, I'll be presenting at C4D Live as well. That'll be pretty cool. Um, looking forward to that. And let's see, what else do we got going on? Okay, covering other bits of news. Jump this over. I just released a new tutorial yesterday for Tutorial Tuesday. It's an advanced Espresso controls tutorial. It is not, you don't have to have known any Espresso beforehand to use this, but it does get into a couple of like advanced techniques that I really like for like triggering certain conditions. And it can be really powerful for creating controls. It actually originally spawned from a relatively simple question during a Rocket Lasso Live. But that is out. I do feel a little bit weird about making tutorials still in Expresso when we have the node, the scene nodes starting to come out. But those are still in their tech preview state. So, you know, I'm not fully comfortable making tutorials for that as things will be changing. But hopefully in the future that will change. Well, guaranteed in the future that will change. But whenever that is. Um... And then I did just post uh, the replay from last week's episode, which is scrolling up oddly. I'll have to double check that. But the, um, yeah, this is uh, the Rocket Lasso live from last week with Jonathan Winbush, Jonathan Winbush, where we go over a bunch of uh, Cinema 4D Unreal stuff, which was also really fun. I'll put links in the chat just in case anybody is interested in checking out the tutorial and or this episode actually here's a really important thing uh go ahead and click on the second link i'm posting which is the uh, i want everybody to do this click on the second link that is the jonathan winbush episode because i actually have two different channels i have two different channels for rocket lasso and one is where I do the live streaming from and post the main tutorials, but I post the replays of the live streams into a secondary channel because I didn't want to span the main channel with a bunch of uh, live content because obviously that's less curated. So everybody, if you are at all interested, head on over to the link from this episode five and then click on Rocket Lasso Live and subscribe to this channel as well because that is where you're going to see the replays. And I got way more people following the main channel than the secondary one and I think I don't promote it enough. So that is this week's um, like thing that everybody should go do. Um, uh, let's see. There's a question from, from Pro Tools. Will Nick be in my room? Uh, nope, he will not be here in the office. He will be coming in through Skype just like I've been having most of the guests virtually. Nick is not in Chicago anymore, so that would not be super practical anyway, uh, even in normal times. Um, typed question, appreciate that. Okay, everybody's getting those links together. I appreciate it. We've got our Cinema 4D R23 ready to go. So, um, Chad, 
you should add other channel add the other channel to the main channel page as a related channel is it not i mean they're, they're both spawned off the same account is that not anything i'll copy and paste your comment into my notes to as something to go double check did I get the time zone right with the UTC? I like that universal time code. I used to try and use Greenwich Mean Time, but they always got out of sync. And I know yesterday I did the wrong time code. But in any case, we got lots of questions starting to come in, and I would like to tackle those. Dean was totally on the ball with a link right away, so I do want to click on his first. Give me a split second to pop this open, mute the tap. Oh, it's yarn. Okay, first of all, something I want to mention is last week, somebody posted a link to a documentary video from like the BBC and my video immediately got copyright claimed just from no audio, just playing the video over it. So I gotta be careful about uh, playing too long and too large in the screen of video because, uh, well, I don't monetize the video, so it's not like that matters, but I thought it was kind of funny that it got copyright claimed. Um, well, let's see, this is from uh, Rory uh, McLean and it's really cool looking. Um, they don't, oh, they do say, no. They don't call out a software specifically. Oh, no. Yeah, it's uh, vel uh, Vellum in Houdini. So, obviously, it's not something that we have. This isn't made in cinema, so we can't make any specific assumptions about anything. Um, pretty cool. A lot of... Oh, here's the thing. What I'm seeing here looks kind of accurate. It looks... I mean, it's motion graphics-y, but... A lot of like the weaves and stuff I see are faked and this doesn't look faked. It looks like this is actually interwoven with each other and you get all this really great fuzziness to it. I don't know how much of that type of thing we'll be able to tackle. In fact, I'm trying to think of even the most basic parts of this where what would be my approach for scaling, scaling these lines up in any kind of semi procedural way. That's a that's a tricky one. It's a really good it's a really good question. Um so how would I go about just as like the very very first step here if we had something let's uh let's do a simple example and this is going to give us a very even uh subdivision of points. I'll just create a helix double the spiral and if I were to make this editable it's going to have exactly 100 points which is just a good starting point for us to tinker. Uh, I guess they're not very evenly spaced. Um, I was hoping they'd be evenly spaced. Well, here's a, here's a trick. If you, if you want to do a somewhat manual way of getting those evenly spaced, we could create a Mo spline, set that to spline mode, change this to line mode, go to spline, feed in the helix, and now this, uh, there's parametric ways of doing it as well, but if I were to make this most spline editable, you can now see that, well, that's not as even as I thought it would be. That's currently generating a, oh, here, let's change this to like a step mode. So every 10 units, it's creating a step. So now if I make it editable, now you see that these all look very evenly spaced out. It takes a couple steps to get there, but that is now evenly subdividing them, and it is kind of clean and parametric. So, um, so I, I'm not even sure what our possibilities are going to be here. Also, I, I had been, I got to take this back. I had been kind of complaining that I didn't like that the floor didn't show up in the viewport anymore. I like that as geometry, but turns out that I keep on going to presets animation. And when I'm in the animation preset, it turns off by default the environment. And it turns out the floor is now marked as an environment object. So if I turn environment back on, the floor comes back on. So that was on me. So... Um, yeah, that's a floor that shall become, I'll select both of them, right click, simulation, and add soft body. Of course, the floor won't be a soft body, but that's cinema smart enough to stop that from doing it anyway. So now this is a soft body. I should be able to play, and you just see that tiny little bloop falls to the floor. Okay, now soft body splines are the only mechanism that I think that we have that could possibly, it's the only mechanism that we have to have like splines that can tangle up with each other. Nothing else will allow a spline to tangle. So that does limit us to that. The problem is, is we do have one control here under our soft body for rest length. But here's the tricky part. Rest length is great and it would scale things up for us, but it's going to scale it up uniformly. It's going to scale it up everywhere. Technically, we can feed a vertex map, but... 
There is no such thing as a vertex map for splines. Uh, Burned, if you're still here in the chat, I would desperately love if vertex maps could handle splines as well. So you could weight spline points and feed that in here and that spline points could actually be weighted differently. But this is only expecting vertex maps, which only work on like polygon objects. So it's, it is really cool that with this rest length, I could keyframe that. So keyframe that at this time, go forward a couple of frames and then scale this up to 200%. And we'll see the spline actually grow and you'll see it actually do these really cool patterns where it like spirals out and whatnot. That's cool, I like that. Um, but yeah, you see that that's got some limitations. Um, well, it's got some limitations in that there's no fall off we can drag in anywhere. Like, you know, soft bodies just don't have fall off tags. And then in addition, this map doesn't have, we, we can't drive it via a map. So if we don't have that as an option, the next thing that pops into my head is let's kill off that rest length. And what if I don't know that this will work, but it's kind of a, it's a workaround that might give us something. So here's a thought. If we were to get rid of tons of the structural, like let's go down to like 1%, and I'm, I'm going to kind of kill everything. So I'm making a very weak structural shear and flexion. Um, let's also turn off gravity, control D, dynamics, gravity. So there's no gravity. Everything should just be sitting there. Now the thought is, if we were to, because there's not much in the way of structure on any of this, if I were to bump a part of this structure, it would drift away. So let's see if that works. I will make that a collider body. I think by copying that tag, it should automatically have the proper properties. Hit play. It'd probably be helpful if I crank up our timeline a bit. And now if I scoot that up and bump, do you, okay, now do you see how that's essentially has the ability to stretch and everything else is still interacting and they'll still collide with each other. So that's all working pretty well. And we are stretching out, it is dynamic. And I think that something along these lines is going to be our best bet. So how do we control this a little bit more? Oh yeah, there's also this refresh issue. If I, you see how it didn't refresh on zero until I like moused over in a particular spot and then it did trigger a refresh. So something to keep in mind. Um, with the soft body, I think we could go and drain a lot of energy out from the system. So let's even do that here in the damping. So I wanna drain 99%, 99%, 99%. We don't want any stiffness, but the main thing being, actually, I don't think this affects splines too much. We've got the linear damping, and I don't think drag and lift does anything on a spline, but let's give it a try. Well, let's go step by step. Let's poke that again with the sphere, boop. And yeah, you see that it's draining the energy out. And actually, all that damping seems to have made these all be a little bit more uniform. I don't want that, so uh, I, I take back what I just said. Um, this will drop down to 1%, 1%, 1%. So that obviously had some effect on those being individualized. So the more that we increase the damping, the more that the spline can kind of independently behave. So that's one thing. Next up, next up, uh, I want to drain the energy out from here. So, and once again, you see it's not refreshing the way I want to until I go for forward one frame. So that's a bit of a bug. Let's go to 99.99% linear and angular damping. And let's see if that has any effect. I don't know that it will. But if I were to poke that, yeah. Um, hmm, it's definitely different. But like those points definitely still want to travel. It's different, but mm, not in the way I was anticipating. We'll put those back to default because the one I think that I was already anticipating was gonna work best for us is using a simulate forces friction. It's crazy that these field forces, not the field force, but all these other forces have been in cinema for so long and they kept on integrating them into the newer system. So it makes them pretty great. I'm going to attempt to just do a friction here and see what that does. That should be draining tons of energy out. There we go. Yeah, good. Oh, it looks like something exploded. I might have this number up a bit high, so we'll slow that down. Um, so with that friction draining energy out, you see that that is actually slowing us down. And I think that that is going to give us the best version that we'll be able to get here. And now I want you to pay attention to the fact that I... I essentially built out this rig. I, I didn't build, I, I didn't immediately start with a big complicated version of everything. Um, I simplified what we were going to be tackling to a single spline to figure out the mechanics of it. And now we can go and try and start making that a little bit fancier. So that's going to be them moving apart. Uh, as some people are saying in the 
chat that one of the big selling points is making the lar- the, the making the yarn look really great. And I do agree that is like a huge variable here. The um, let's take a look. So we've got all these oops, get the proper window you get all these great looking strands i gotta say we've never in uh, we get a lot of yarn questions and i mean that just goes to the string stuff always looks great we've never been able to create a super duper great looking yarn part of that is probably my obsession with keeping everything as parametric as possible and I'm trying to think of what a, a good approach will be right now. There's like there's some different thoughts I have, um, because you could fake a lot of that. One of the main ones being if we were to take a, we can't just use we we will use hair to render, but we can't use hair to generate the lines around it along it. I don't think, but I do want to control this via let's say a helix in a cloner, the cloner will be, uh, I'll actually just make it a linear with zero change on position. And now we can make exactly as many as we want. So we could make up to 50 count all directly on top of each other. Uh, we already know that the length is going to be something of an issue. There'll be something we have to constantly tweak, but I will make this height 1000 to start out with. Now with this cloner, we can feed in a, a random effector, which is going to spread them all out in these different directions. Uh, which is exactly what I want, except actually that doesn't make them round. It actually makes them square. If we view this from the side, you'll see that by the nature of what we just did, it makes them square looking. If I were to, let me show you, if I keep on cranking up the count, we're going to more and more clearly see that this is actually generating a square and not a circle because randomly it's moving it up 50 down 50 or maybe 25. I don't remember. So what if we wanted that to be round? Well, the quickest way to do that, I think, will be to make it a radial and I want to make sure that this is a radial in the proper orientation. Let's turn off that random for a moment. And yeah, that's not the orientation I want. So let's change this to B. I'm just guessing, I guess the first one. There we go. So now we got a radial on those lines. I can go back to making 50 and that, that is now a circle, but we can still do a radius of zero. Uh, let's do one just in case. And with this radius of zero, if I were to grab random and let's look at this from the side again. Now, as this pushes out, in fact, let's simplify zero, zero, zero. Yeah, I don't know which one it is, but let's try, I, I would think it's Z, but no, Z's forward, so probably X. Yeah, now as I spread them out, this is pushing out based on their current direction. So it's actually gonna randomly push them out in all, it's actually just pushing them out is what it's doing. And, but each one has their own unique rotation. So based on this setup, we now get a round layout, just a little detail there. Um, okay, so no randomness pushing forward. They're all just kind of in a line going forward. They're filling up that entire volume. Different random seeds will fill up the space in different ways. Um, so uh, we want that to be relatively thin. Let's drop that down to five. And now how well can we deform these? I'm trying to think if I would deform these with probably a random. Honestly, let's just go with a random. Why not? So there's reasons to do it different ways, but we will use a random effector. And then um, I will put this into a connect object directly into the connect, holding that alt. That gets this random. I'll rename that random deform. I keep doing that der form. Uh, deform, random deform. And I will turn this into a deformer. Affect all the points. It's going to super explode which is fine. We need to zero out X, Y, and Z. Okay, so um, as I start increasing this amount, you see we're immediately gonna get some, I guess frizziness is a good way to put it. And I want that to go up and down and I want it to go left and right, which is obviously X. So I'll increase that as well. Oh, maybe it's not. Maybe it's Z based on the, yeah, it's based on the rotation of the spline. So that makes sense. So now you see I've got all this noise traveling left and right all over the place. Um, I wonder, I'm trying to think of the best way of calming that down. There's several ways, but I'm curious. This is, uh, this is actually already subdivided. If I say none, yeah, okay, these subdivisions matter. You see this uniform subdivision is actually creating extra subdivisions for us. I actually don't want that. I want to have very direct control over how many points there are. So I can type in 1,000 and there's exactly 1,000 points. Um, probably the easiest way to clean this up will just be changing this to a noise type and 
it's really big right now. Set the animation speed to zero, scale down to one. And as soon, yeah, as soon as I drop it to one, you can see, start seeing a little bit of uniformity. If we change this to, does it work on indexed? Um, probably not actually, because it's indexing each one individually. So that's actually not the way I'd prefer to do it. Hmm, a couple different layers. I don't want to spend too much time on this specific aspect because there's a lot that we got to do. Um, but if I start increasing this, each point is being individually calculated and I actually want it to be not. But currently it's kind of eh, the only setting that we have is to apply it directly to the entire spline or I'm sorry, to every spline or to each individual point. And I kind of want the in-between. I want it to be one entire spline. We could rearrange the hierarchy and drop this directly as a child of one of the helixes. And now it's going to generate on the helix. Um, these are all identical splines, but they are rotated differently, which is enabling them to look kind of different. Um, I don't know that this is going to be the best method, but here is a thought. If I were to make a duplicate helix, then this random setup, uh, I did set it up with a random form. I think if I move the random, it Oh, no, moving it doesn't change it. I guess we can change the scale. That's not, the, there's no, there's unfortunately no random seed when we're using random noise it is a random former. There's a random noise, there's a random seed in the random field, but not in the effector. So the only way I can randomize this would probably be changing the scale a bit, but that's not terribly infinitely random, which is kind of what I was hoping to get. Uh, um, you know what, we always, we always kind of mess up when it comes to drawing these threads, so I will spend a little extra time on those. So I was doing this with a random deform, but that random deform is not going to work because it doesn't give us all of the power, but now we need to use a plane effector so we can use a random field. So let's do the same thing. This will be a plane dot deform. It will be a point deformer. I don't want to... What did we have it on before? I think it was just five and five on Y and Z. Seems to be good. And then give it a fall off. And here's where it gets a little bit tricky and I will temporarily turn off this cloner. Um, what I would like to do is, ha well, let's add in the random first. So we need a random field. And now you can see we have a nice random field and it automatically defaults to a noise. And you see we get these nice wiggles traveling all along it, working quite well. Um, and actually, you, okay, so here's one of the tricks. You see it's traveling at this 45 degree angle. I forgot that that's also an issue. So when it comes to using a plane deformer, it doesn't view each angle independently. So we need to have this just travel on a single axis. So this will be plane deform on just Y, let's say. So it's just on Y and you can see this now traveling up and down. And then we need a second unrelated one traveling left and right. I guess we could ignore this detail, but something I wanna point out, do you see as I, if I go from zero and as I increase it, a random deformer would be pushing up and down, but this plane deformer is only pushing up. We're only feeding it a positive value. Let's see if we can get around that by decreasing our minimum. And then inside of the fall off, I would like this random to be outputting from negative 100 to positive 100. And now you see it did go down, but it's clamping. So let's unclamp it. So I had to change all of those settings in order for this to actually push up and down. Um, so now we get our flat line and we can see if I turn this off yet, yeah, the line is there and as I increase, it actually goes up and down. So we have to do all those steps. And then I could duplicate this plane deform again. This one is actually plane deform dot Y. This one's plane deform dot X. And the second one, I can feed a completely different random seed and tell this deformer to deform not on Y, but on, where was it, Z? Nope, it is X, good, four. So now you see I get wiggles traveling left and right and up and down, but we had to make a significantly more complex setup in order to make it work, but it is now very, very controllable. Selecting both of those, we now have the ability to increase our scale. So those are going to get larger and more uniform depending on how those change. We do have to keep in mind that 
one is referencing the other. Actually, we're getting these harder kinks in there. I kind of wasn't expecting that. And it's, it's probably because this is deforming first and this is deforming second. And based on, but the noise is pretty large. I'm, I'm not sure why it's doing that, to tell you the truth. Why would it be doing that? Hmm. Hmm. I want those to be smooth. The whole, the whole point of the setup was to make that be smooth. But yeah, look at how it's passing through. That is not good. If I were to flip this, the order. Well, that's odd. That's odd. Well, is it applying X? Oh, blah. Random remapping field scale. It almost doesn't seem to be doing anything. Why is X? Why is X not doing anything? If we look at this from the top view, it's hard to tell from that view. But right here, here's our X deformer. I'm telling it to calculate first. It's got a large scale. I'll decrease that just so we can see it more quickly. Did I click something wrong? Like, what is different? Hmm. Did somebody see me click something I shouldn't have? Because this X deformer pushing on X, maybe it isn't X, maybe it's Z. It is Z. What? Okay, well, it was supposed to be Z. I thought I double checked it and it seemed correct. Well, okay, that was not supposed to be on Z. That actually, those two combined to kind of explain everything, but could have sworn that we checked that properly I guess it's probably based on these the space being based on the field and these are probably based on the node yeah so they're bending based on the node not to the local space of the spline so that's just my confusion anyway we can deform this to whatever degree we want we want and scale these to whatever degree we want and get the variation that's a really really meticulous long-winded way of making it so that we can create a copy here and now we do get those same wiggles you see how they're behaving the exact same way but here's where it's neat if i were oh hopefully this works and i should save this because i haven't yet do, do, do. i didn't show the preview of next week's tutorial i was going to do that uh episode six scene files number one do 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 um let's just call it yarn uh let's see also would like to hide these fields and effectors. So if I were to make a duplicate of this helix and inside of these type in a completely different random seed. So I'll say X plus nine, 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 nine. So those are really offset from each other. What I'm hoping is I can go into my blend and say, hey, blend between all the parameters of each of those. And now every single one of the, let's see how many, 100 different strings running through there every single one of those is getting its own completely unique seed and so this has now maximum variation between them those are all completely different completely unrelated so that was a whole bunch of work to get infinitely wiggling lines but i'm quite pleased that we do now have that we'll probably have to tweak some settings and we have to remember that any change i make to one i have to make to the other at the exact same time so let's just keep all that in mind all right um now, when it comes to yarn, there's two main variables. We want to have a, we want to have this main structure and we really should look at photos of yarn, but because we have this reference handy. So we've got that main structure to it, but we also want these little fuzzy lines. I also recall that we probably are gonna have some trouble colorizing these each uniquely. So we might have trouble getting variation in color. Just keep that in mind. I remember that from like previous times we got similar questions. Um, if I wanted there to be randomness in, or if I want some like random strands coming out, there's several different ways we could probably go about doing that. If I were to turn, let's see, what is the way I want to do it right now? We could, the one that immediately pops into mind, but I don't know if it's a good idea, would be let's turn this connector on and then add a hair object. Let's do that. Uh, that is now under simulate hair, add hair. Let's see if that works. Seemingly yes. So now 
you see we got all these hairs there are a ton of them i would like these to be generated on the segments of the spline and i don't need nearly that many let's simplify uh, eight segments a length of 100 i'm not sure if that's too long or not long enough the direction we don't have a lot of options as far as direction we get the normal we get the normals we get a set direction or a random direction so if we say random that could work but I, i'd prefer that they were all peeling away from the center point so perhaps because we're uniformly generating these i guess it depends on how they get deformed but they are all they are all lined up right now which means if we display the hairs as guides so now we have only exactly the like 1000 as hairs and then in the editor i'd like to see the final hair lines we can see all of them because there's not that many i would now like to deselect it and as i make changes to the actual hair material specifically something like frizziness then now you can see them actually peel away um let's try curl or possibly bend bend is a very mechanical one and if it's uniform in its direction direction random actually isn't bad so let's add more bend yeah so this is pretty good let's add a lot of bend and a lot of variation so some can peel away and some won't so that, that works pretty well um so uh tweaks to this uh hairs are a bit long even if we zoom out those really fuzzy threads and let's make that what 25 Nah, not quite enough we'll go a little overboard being at 50. In addition, those are all randomly generated. I will say I want a particular direction. Oh, they're, I thought we were gonna get a positive and a minus, but they're only one direction. So how do I flip half of them 180? Maybe symmetry, I don't know if that's a thing. No, I don't wanna make editable. Update, no. Nope, nope. Dang it, uh, that only gives us direct, it's only giving us fuzziness in one direction. We are already spending a lot of time on this one. I'm not, I don't wanna spend any more time than we have to. So that's gonna be our fuzziness for now. We do have control over it. If I were to tell this, I'm not sure it's a good idea. I'm gonna say don't render hairs, instead generate a spline. So that's a physical spline in the scene. But what that means is with that being actual geometry, if I drop this hair into this connect object, then I, I can deform it alongside everything else. And now we've got our nice fuzzy thread, meaning if we want to start mapping that on the things, we've got our original helix and we don't run any dynamics on the spline itself. We'll hit save again, just in case. I would like to create a spline wrap, drop that into the connect. It is not on the correct orientation. I would like this to be axis Z plus, and now it's traveling along that line and the spline is going to be the helix and that should wrap it around there's two important settings right now to keep in mind we have mode fit the spline which means it's going to stretch whatever we got to match the entire thing it does look like we're approximately the right length but you can also change this to keep length and now actually you see that that's actually how long it wanted to be and if we wanted to match the length properly we should go into these two helix and let's say double the height and give it a second to refresh and now you see i'm a lot closer to it being the proper length to be honest i do like it stretching in a lot of ways you can't really visually tell too much so let that refresh you see that's really close now i had to make it longer but it's good so now i could switch this back to fit the spline but i know i'm not stretching that much so it's kind of nice to be able to jump between the two all right having done that the spline wrap is probably not going to be the quickest thing to calculate because we are generating a thousand points times 100 and then a bunch of hairs and doing deformations on all of that so i want to you know go lenient on it we might make it editable honestly um but we'll save that and let's see if we can get actually that's not supposed to spine wrap the helix is supposed to be spine wrapping the most spline. same difference in this case let's see how quickly this runs for our testing purposes hit save again just in case hit play actually we just see what the frame rate is here uh five frames a second not well okay and this also seems to be a little twitchy but let's bump that up uh oh okay we got some problems the we are deforming the spline but the spline wrap is not seeing the deformed version of our line 
that's a problem. Let's see if we can get around it. Uh, my first thought, throw that into a connect object. And with that being a connect object, can we spline wrap to the connect? Also, this is connecting. I don't know if that actually has to be a connector. So I will, oh no, wait, is the hair? The hair might be, oh, the hair is getting copied onto the connect. That's a little dangerous. So I'll put that into a group and then drop this out and pull this out. Doesn't really change the hierarchy. I just want to make sure that the hair is doesn't, isn't doing a feedback loop. Uh, doesn't really change much. Anyway, that is now supposed to be spine wrapping on the connect. But you see that as soon as I said put it on the connect, if I put in the most spline, it works. If I put it on this connect, it doesn't. There's one trick we might be able to do to make that work, and that is to put the connect into a spine mask, which sometimes tricks objects into realizing that that is indeed a spline. But I got doesn't see. Oh, okay. It's not seeing the connect, but it will see the spline mask, which is forcing the connect to be acknowledged as a spline. At least that's a workaround I usually do. But I, that doesn't tell us if this is going to work or not. If I hit play, um, I'm not sure what just happened. Definitely some weirdness. Um, I'll move the floor down a hair. No pun intended. Does that actually stop on the floor or is it just continuing to fall? Um, it's kind of offset a little bit oddly. I'm not sure why it's offset, but before we concern ourselves with that, how about hitting play? And let's see if this, ah, oh, it doesn't acknowledge it. Dang. Um, yeah, this setup is not acknowledging the spine wrap is not seeing the end result of the, what we're doing with the hairs. Now that's not to say it's not going to work. It's just not going to work completely parametrically. So I'll move the dynamics back here. Temporarily, we could turn off the spine wrap. Like, let's not even concern ourselves with any of that. And my thought is we need to bake it. Of course, I can't bake it with the bump happening. So I'll have to keyframe that to bump up. Let's do a very simple test. Keyframe on Y, hit play, let it run forward a little bit. Right around there, I'll have said that that, oop, pause. This cube should have come up and bumped. And then I'll just guess a random amount of time and go back down. All right, that should hopefully do its thing. Keep in mind those won't move, but we should. Well, actually, even this most spline doesn't seem to be. Uh, but with the change I'm making, I think that this might be fine. So now we should see that spline will get hit up into the air, pretty much. Oop, I have the friction turned off. But yeah, it gets hit and then it falls down. Now we already know that that wasn't cloning properly, but there's a decent chance that it will if we bake it. So we don't need all these frames. I'll drop this to 222. Um, bake cache. I would like to bake object uh, relatively quick. Uh, Ehab, yes, hair does make very good grass. For as long as we've had hair in cinema, we've been using it to create fields of grass. Do, 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 and boop. Okay, let's just make sure that indeed that that is running. That should be like already pre-baked in. It gets hit and then it pretty much freezes. So that's fine. Now, does the spline wrap see the baked version of that? No. Does the spline wrap see the connect version of that? Oh yeah, it still doesn't like that connect. I'll drop it into the spline mask. Doesn't like that, but then if I put the spline mask in, it will see that, but does that see the baked version? Dang it. Doesn't like that either. I'm, mm, I'm trying to think if I've got any other tricks up my sleeve. The Okay, here's the last trick I've got. What if we make a second most spline, and I'm gonna tell this most spline to reference this other one. So you reference that one. So that's now a baked dynamic one. Here's a most spline doing its own thing. We need to see if hide that original is the most spline copy moving. No, it's not. Nothing is seeing that dynamic spline. Dang. Hmm. 
I'm pretty sure we've run into similar problems. Uh, Bush Dr. Beats, we are tinkering around with this really cool yarn growth animation from Rory McLean. McLean. Um, uh, tracer. Uh, Sid is saying we could try Tracer. Yeah, uh, Tracer, actually, that's not a bad idea. The Tracer does see things sometimes others don't. So I will try putting a Tracer. It's seeing the most blind. I'll say, see, we're not seeing the original one. So this Tracer, oh, yeah, and hide the helix as well. So tell the Tracer to connect all elements. And now you see that the Tracer has generated a new spline where the other one was by connecting each point. And let's see if that sees it. Hitting play. Nope, it didn't move either. It's not seeing the baked most blind. The I guess the last check on that would be the connector tracer trick. Tell the tracer to Roop. tell the tracer to see the spline mask. Nope, doesn't see that either. Dang. Well, it was worth a shot. If that. Isn't if it seems like nothing is willing to see the dynamic spline, and I think I don't I don't want to blame the most spline just for an experiment. Let's clear out our dynamic cache. I want to just run this straight up on the helix. I just want to see if there's a difference, so you can see that that runs. So we don't need too many frames. One one one. Dynamic, bake object. <sighs> yeah, we could try and bake it to PLA. That starts getting so brute force, I, I really don't like it. But that's another technical possibility. So that should be baked now, meaning I should be able to scrub forward and backward. So with that moving, does the spline wrap see a helix? That seems highly unlikely. Then, that doesn't work, but does the, I'll just try the tracer as one final check. Oh, did the, the tracer seem to react to that one. Oh, but that oh, that deformation is weird. Is that the same deformation? Yeah, technically. Um, I guess the layout of those splines is very different. Uh, but yeah, interestingly, the tracer is seeing this slightly wonky deformation. So just keeping that in mind, if we tell that to see the tracer, why is... Well, you can see the hairs are responding and those are actually moving up. So this layout via baking did work. It didn't like the spline, the most spline, which is very strange. But I don't know why we're getting all this drift. Oh, I do know why we're, I might know why we're getting that drift because the spline wrap is deforming the object that the hair is on, but it's also deforming the hair. So that's like double deformation. So potentially I can just do that and then the oh, the hair will follow potentially nope it doesn't it seems to have lost this connection um, well we could turn off the dynamics on the hair does that work yeah okay that at least makes them stick so they're not dynamically disconnected it is following and we are going to be making a different spline but it's interesting that the tracer is willing to see the helix but the most spline in between wasn't working. But you do see that we are now getting a collision happening. Hmm. I didn't. It was kind of like a, a Hail Mary to try and change the helix. But strangely, it did sort of work. Um, okay, geez. So now we have. We sort of have a deformation. We didn't really build a full setup here, but. The idea of we have these different threads, I think, is the next thing that we'd want to take a look at, is can we get these to render reasonably? Uh, we could do Redshift. Um, I'm kind of inclined not to use Redshift right now for rendering these. Let's just keep it vanilla hair, and I know Redshift actually does a really good job with hair, 
But I just, I'm curious, and I almost guarantee we're not going to get a bunch of different colored hairs along on the uh, piece of fabric, the piece of yarn. But let's just see what we do get. So I would like to render out, let's just try the different layers. Let's just see if those render at all. Hit render. Okay, nothing's rendering with hair. Try turning off the spline mask. Does that render? No, I guess that's good. We don't want that to render if the other one wasn't. Um, why aren't those hairs rendering? That is the current mystery. Delete this off of here. That's not deforming. So why do these hairs not render that? I feel like those should be rendering, shouldn't they? Why wouldn't they be? The only thing we turned off was dynamics. Everything else is pretty vanilla. The render setting should have, yeah, that's already got hair in there. Standard render, yes. This is just a plain old hair object. I should be able to pull it out. It's even got its original material. Why aren't those rendering? Hmm. This is why we don't answer yarn questions. Um... Yeah, Pierre is saying I should have just been showing off recall with this. I, I, I'm actually kind of intending to use recall on certain points, but we're not seeing things. Um, oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah, Zach, that's true. I did set the hair to a spline, but hair should render on a spline. But, yeah, I did turn these into splines. If I turn them back into a hair, that's fine, but, but isn't... Shouldn't if I make this editable, then well, let me just try something. If I make a like text object and we drop a hair material on there and I hit render, then it does render. If that's a spline and it's rendering, then it should be fine. I'll delete this hair material and then drag it onto here so it's actually a copy of one off of a spline and I'll hit render and it still doesn't show up. Okay, this is another problem that I think we have run into, which is the hair object. When it comes to modules, when it comes into an object inside of Cinema, they're written like they're a plugin. And the hair, I think the way the internal hair structure works is only certain things can see it. It is not, this piece of hair is not by itself acknowledged as a spline like by itself. If I make it editable, it'll turn into a spline. And as soon as I do, as soon as I make it editable, I bet you that that will render. Yeah, as soon as I make it editable, it does render because now it's being acknowledged as a spline. But when it's a being told to output as a spline, it is by itself not being treated like it is a spline. Can we trick it into being a spline? And all, every time we're adding in these spline masks and whatnot, we are technically creating slowdown. But let's try that. No, that still doesn't acknowledge it. Uh, I don't want to make that editable. We could. We could make that editable. And potentially that is a use case for recall. Um, yeah, I mean, all of these aren't supposed to be dynamic anymore. So, you know what? Maybe this is, maybe it is time to say, hey, let's put recall in here. So, you don't, okay, so I'm going to show you a little hint of a plugin that we put together. We released this back in September, I believe. So, this is Rocket Lasso's first plugin. You do not need to use it. I hate, you know, pushing for plugins too much during live streams, but. We could take this and make duplicates of it. I could make a copy of the hair and then make duplicates and you know turn them off and then make changes. Um, there are limitations to that. If I were to drop the hair into this connect object and I'm gonna put that entire thing into a null. On this null, oh, does it not like the uh, hair in the connect? I don't think it does. Oh, come on, why is the, I haven't even done anything yet. Why is this hair? Oh, the hair doesn't have the material on there. And the material is, it's what is giving it its curve, right? Oh, come on, what did I just do? Undo, undo, undo. Why did we lose the hair curve? Huh, the hairs are just like, nope, we're done. Regrow. Um normal regrow okay i had to regrow it go figure um actually and i mean along these lines i haven't re specifically used recall for this type of setup but 
if we I'm going to put a recall tag up onto this null up here. Just say right click recall and then so this is the plugin. And if I double click that, that should store this entire hierarchy in its current state. Meaning I can say okay hairs, you have now been made editable. Okay, all of you hairs, you have now been made editable and baked down. And let's see. Oop, that is really chugging. There's probably a really complex hierarchy underneath this thing. Let me see what's there. I'm curious. Yeah, okay, it has created like a million of those. So if I hit delete, then that should have baked this down to, wow, there's so many copies of that. There's like a thousand uh, times two times two copies of that. But anyway, those are all now gone. So this should be running crazy fast. And now if I put these hairs on everything, I should be able to hit render. And now everything will indeed render. Although the secondary one, I don't want to bend on it. Actually, it's been baked down. So I don't think that bend is deforming anything anymore. No, it's not. Excellent. Which means, yeah, we do want a second hair, but the second hair material. Open up the window. I do not need the bend anymore. Okay, cool. So that goes there and copy it here. And now we should have a series of hairs that indeed render and have baked, been baked down. So no changes can be made there. But here's the important part is if I did want to bring that hierarchy back, I can make a null in this case move the recall tag on that null and double click and you see it's brought back the original hair and the original um, connector. So that, that continues to live on is what recall is giving us. So this has all been baked down. It's funny, but you know, everybody knows I'm so, I'm so obsessed with um, keeping things parametric that the first plugin that Rocket Lasso made was a plugin that says, well, if you have to make it parametric, you can always go back again. Um, anyway, now we have a helix that is kind of baking and a spline wrap that should be able to turn on it is traveling around that tracer. And if we hit play, then it's probably gonna run relatively quickly now because we did bake everything down. So yeah, that does run quicker. So now we have this slightly modified cleaner layout. Okay, now we already talked briefly about the fact that sadly, when it comes to splines, like these will render and they'll look great. Although it does look, because it's a line of hair, it looks kind of kind of like a big gross line of hair. Um, make it look a little bit more like yarn by putting a something slightly more colorful. Let's go with a nice teal-ish color. And we'll just make that solid all the way through. That should already look better. And then, um, let's see, yarn's probably super thin. So let's go to thickness, make it 0 0.5, 0 0.5 all the way through. That's probably, oh, that is a 50. 0.5, please. Yeah, nice and thin all the way through, possibly thinner. 0.25, make it half that amount. Yeah, those get thinner. And the big thing that's going to change the way this looks is the specular. So by, if we increase the strength, then that gets very bright. If we start pulling back the, the sharpness, then it's gonna start spreading that out. I'll temporarily turn off the secondary. And we can just see how this one is not very sharp to make it kind of feel softer, not quite as bright. And yeah, so we get a softer look overall. Make that as bright or sharp as we want. That's fine. Um, and then we could, let's say that's 44. We could bring up the secondary one, which yeah, it's very blue. And I don't want that one very sharp either. Yeah, that's fine. We'll just give them both kind of a medium amount. And just something. Anyway, the sad part is, is as powerful as hair is, this hue variation does not acknowledge individual splines. So it, that only works on the actual hair object. So I could give this a ton of hair vari color variation. Oh wait, it does work. Okay, well, never mind. I thought that that wasn't gonna work. What is the circumstance in which that didn't work? Because that totally does work. And a little bit of variation in the color here is gonna go a super long way. So yeah, there we go, that's cool. Okay, I didn't think that that worked. Maybe it's because we made it editable. And because we're using recall, we can always bring it back again. So I don't mind making it editable. So yeah, that's a thing. Okay, so that's something. Um, okay, let me think. Okay, well, now we've spent a bunch of time. We have actually made kind of some yarn. Um, it's nowhere near fuzzy enough um, from what I'd actually want. And I do feel like we should spin this around a bunch so we can go to rotation. And here is a rotation spline. So I could pull this up and now it's spinning it around a bunch. Um, but doesn't it need a rotation value? 
where oh there's rotation strength so I, I think it's spinning 360 but if we say no go five times it's like five times 360 so that probably is twisting around let's go 5,000 okay yeah we definitely feel it now so that's spinning around a bunch and that gives us these curls which I, I think we're offset from a center point because of those random bend hairs but it's kind of offsetting it I actually don't mind that but we'd have to reset the the bounding box to make that work yeah you see how we're getting these offsets in the bounding box so if i were to fix the bounding box and zero those out then yeah it's going to smooth them all out quite a bit and then hitting render now we can see how they're all twirling around we could add additional fuzziness now but that twirl it goes a long way to making that look better all right so that is that step <sighs> okay now Let's talk about that weave that we saw. Somebody early on. <laughs> donut. That, well, I think you just deleted your comment, but I liked it. Um, okay. Okay, 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 okay. We need to create this weave. Somebody was saying there was like a particular formula we can type in and probably get like a parametric one. I'm not going to worry about that. Let's just let's just eyeball this. Um, now I don't, off the top of my head, like intellectually know the formula for creating, like a, a formula for creating a weave, or even mechanically speaking, what the exact thing should be. So we can just make up something. Um, and we just have to make sure it actually kind of works. So now we're going to start trying to make a little bit of a weave. We're not going to go overboard because, you know, we are working with a lot of splines and we're going to get a lot of slowdown. Having said all that, what do I want to do? Well, we can, hmm, I want to create a series of waves in this. We could do formulas to create sine waves and then you could do a secondary thing. Um... Let me think, because yeah, it goes out. I mean, the, the thing we kind of want is to go out, bubble around, and then come back again. We could just make one and duplicate a bunch of times. We want to interconnect them, so that kind of is stopping me from doing it. Um, let me think. I mean, we could do very simple ones. We could also just coil them if we do leave this with some rotation and a little bit of depth. There are a couple cool tricks you can do if I spin this several times. Have I ever, I've, I'm sure I've kind of talked about this before, but something that's kind of neat is if I take this um, spiral, if we view that spiral from the top, you actually get a perfect sine wave, which means if I were to do something like take this helix and feed it into a cloner, and I only want a clone of one, and then I say transform this to be 0 0.001 in height, then I've essentially in a way parametric, parametrically scaled that down to zero. It's very, very, very thin. And now we get this wavy pattern. Um, and then we could deform it somehow. Hmm. How do I want to do this? Because there's also, there's that method, but I do want to throw out there. There's things like the cycloid, which we don't really ever talk about. Let's temporarily hide that floor. If we take the cycloid there is other modes. There's the ep epicycloid, uh, epi I think. And this actually gets, we have a radius to set, but then we have the secondary values like R and A. Is that the one I want? Hmm, start angle, end angle. Okay, oh yeah, so I think I increased that angle. Okay, I'm just gonna be tinkering around here trying to figure out something. As I play with these different numbers, I thought maybe we can do it with the cycloid. Yeah, okay. As we increase the angle, you'll see you actually get more spirals. Woo, woo, woo. So that's the default. We're back to the default cycloid. So, um, so yeah, I can create these spirals. And that's kind of neat. So let's lay that spiral on the ground. We like never use this, but yeah, there's a cycloid. We spun it around a bunch of times. We could say 360 times 10. So that's a pretty even amount. And can we create duplicates? I'll just start by copy and pasting. Is there a place that this could be? Yeah, I guess if we did it like that, 
and then that line happened to pass through. That would give us something of a weave, right? Um, uh, oh, Tobias posted the formula for making it. That is from somebody's Twitter account, from Matt. Um, I don't know how to say his, na his last name. But from Matt Naidoba, perhaps? But yeah, he made a cheat sheet. He made a cheat sheet for creating these different patterns, um, which is pretty cool. But like, I, I don't, well, what does it do? Plated, he's got this whole thing in here. Um, but yeah, uh, I'll, I'll put a link to this in the show notes. Um, really tiny, create structures, X, T, Y, T, Z, T, repeat values of T after, where is I'm not sure what I would be typing in exactly where and even the way these patterns are set up yeah I don't know this is I want to look into that it's really cool I think everybody should check that out um I want to keep it, I guess, a little more simple. I don't know that this is simple. Creating this weave stuff is always, I mean, yeah, using the math that way is neat, but if we can just use a cycloid, I'd be quite pleased. But we do need to twist this around in various ways, and I don't super know how I would go about doing that easily. We could just make it editable, but I, there's probably a lot of points involved in it. Yes, yes, there are. Yeah, that's it's it's literally generating all of those points. Mm -hmm. uh, can I share the link? I shall. There's the link for YouTube. Boop. Um. Normally, I would make these patterns out of like a series of like um, deformations from a displacer. And also, I don't know that we're going to be able to like lock these edges down. So that's another variable to keep in mind. But how... And, and just as an explanation to everybody, like, it's cool that he put that stuff together, but I don't want to just take something he put out into the world and is sharing with everyone and then me just take it and be like, oh, and here it is in my tutorial. Like, everybody should go back to that source material. So I don't, uh, I don't want to just take his stuff, which I feel like I'd be doing if I just took his formula and typed it in right now. I mean, I, you know, that's a meta level thing. Um in my attempt to think of ways of simplifying this, I feel like I'm making it more complicated. Also, there are so many points in the way that these are subdivided. Yeah, there's so many points in the way that those are subdivided. I don't think that would give us a very clean output. You know, it's funny. Um, it's, you know, something that might actually work pretty well. I hadn't thought of it this way, but if we make a matrix object and I set that to linear, and we push this off to the side, we could get a very, very direct control over, bloop, I can make as many of these as I want, and then we can start running formula factor through that and then use a tracer. Um, I mean, I know we have a, I want to get deformation, so we could use a formula spine and type those things in, I know. Oh, uh, he just, oh, he's just typing in these different values in here, so that, <laughs> that covers up that bit, but I still kind of, well, kind of want to do it my own way. So, if we take this matrix and I do something like um, add a formula effector, I would like it to affect not the scale, but yes, the position, but not on X. I would like that to go on Z. So now we get this waviness. So that is a formula effector and it's time based. But if we just take, if we get rid of time as a variable, so that's the that's going to add time to it. And that's a frequency. 
value, that's fine. I think that's a valid formula. ID divided by count. Let's try ID divided by count times two. Excellent, that was the correct one. So I can say however many times I want to multiply. So let's say times five, and now you can see I'm starting to emerge this sine wave from there. Excellent. Now this is specifically affecting the only the numbers I feed it. So that's giving us this little wobbly offset. But if I were to create a second formula, and let's just call this one formula.z, if I were to copy and paste that and say this is formula y, and feed that in after the fact, boop. so that's going to double it. But now if I say, no, no, you now affect the y, we can now affect the y and the z separately. So you can see how it's like traveling upward and down. So I could do something like offset this by 50%. Um, which is probably maybe like ID plus, well, it'd be ID plus some even number, which would be 2.5. So let's just say two and see if the concept works. Mm, no. Uh, count? Well, not count times five. Where do I put the plus? No, that's global. How do I offset those? That's the frequency. We could double the frequency. Um, I don't know if that's a good idea. We'll say times two. And I shouldn't have made, uh, this should be not times five, but let's say times two. So it's gonna happen slower. And that just gives us more resolution and I can shrink it if need be. Okay, let's not be subtle here. Crank those up, we get our big old sine waves. Now, apply it to Y. I would like to copy the formula from Z, just to be on the same footing. So now it should be pushing those up on Y, but I want those to be offset. If I wanna offset, well actually cosine's the opposite, right? So I'll just type in cosine. And yeah, look at that. So that's now revealing almost like a little bit of a helix. Yeah, cosine. That was the jam. So we don't need this many points. So selecting both form, and we can't do both formulas at the same time, but that's now times two. Let's do even numbers, so we'll four, say times four. That way those match. All right, so we say times four. That can now be traced. Tracer, connect elements. So now those connect. I know we could do this with a helix, and essentially we're just seeing a helix again, but there, it's offset in a way that I like. So if that is sort of a setup for one layer, I should be able to say, okay, matrix, create 50 of those. So that should just create more. And we can loop that as many times as we want. And I suppose we're gonna need quite a few of them. Oh, uh, I guess it's dividing the count. Yeah, divided by count makes everything very even. So we still get the same number. So we have to say divided by higher numbers. So let's say double it again. Actually, we'll go up to 16. Yeah, that's fine. We'll go up by 16. Boop. Okay, so now you see I've kind of got this flattened helix look, but with very controllable points. So the main thought is if I offset this properly, does that give us kind of a weave? That's the thought anyway. So I'm going to mm, let's make a copy of the tracer, make this one editable. And if I just take that and scoot it up and then based on the way these are offset, if I move that over the proper amount, then now, yeah, now you see it actually loops over itself. Now we could have done that with a helix and we probably should have done it with a helix, but now you actually do see two of them overlapping on top of each other. So we should be able to create a series of just alternating versions of this and they're very low poly. The very few points, which is good. Uh, so let's make a cloner version of this. I think I can just make a linear field. Make as many as I want. I don't want to go up on Y. I'd like to go on Z, like so. And then every other one needs to be offset a bit. Now I could just make a duplicate of one, but we can use another formula effector and use it in a very simple way. I, I really like using formula effectors this way 
kind of wish there was a built-in something that did this, but if I say don't affect, I will say it's going to affect position, but specifically X. So let's say 55 on X. You see how it's kind of doing this good big old curve, but the formula, and I mentioned this a week or two ago, if you're going to memorize one formula, it should be this. Mod bracket ID semicolon two bracket. What that's saying is every other clone. So that's what that's what this means. Every other clone. And if you type in three, then it's every third clone. Well, it's dividing that space into three. But every other is the valuable one here because I want to do this type of thing all the time. So now this formula factor is going to only affect every other clone. So as I increase this, you can see I'm offsetting every other one, which is exactly what I want to do. And now we have those interlinking. And because that's parametrically set up like that, we can make as many on the count as we want. Now, we're going to have to keep this relatively light because we, you know, we are going to be generating a lot of splines. Um, okay, so if this is going to get baked down, we can go to this tracer object and turn this onto a B spline and give it some uniform subdivisions, which is going to dramatically increase the point count. That's about as smooth as I want to go, maybe right there. So you see those all moving upward. Um, Let's see. The Okay, so what's my next step? Um, because we're going to want all these to be dynamic. And I guess I, they should be, based on the way we're doing this, they sh should be pretty evenly spaced out. Yeah, maybe identically. But we're going to want them all to be able to move upward and do their own thing. Uh, I'm worried about our point count just in general. But, the, the, okay, what am I trying to get at? I'm trying to get at that I think the edges are going to pull away. That's what I'm trying to get at. So let's do this step by step. I don't know if it's a good idea, but I will put this into a connect object. And we'll make that editable. Copy it. Hit undo. So I just wanted a copy of that one. So now I've got a made editable copy of this. And if we take a look at the point count, hopefully we can see that it's decently, it's reasonable. It's not insane. Um, actually, that's probably, yeah, those points come after the fact. We probably want to bake those down because we need, well, eh, dynamics probably will work on them. Now, I would love if we could just say fix these endpoints because that would solve all of our problems. We can't, though. Um, you know, I, honestly, I would like this to, I'm going to save this as another scene file because I would really like to clean up a bunch of things here that are out of date. Like, we baked that down. I can go back to the scene file and get it. I'm going to delete almost everything we don't need. Um, we do need that. So we get the floor, we get the original helix, but we're going to be getting rid of that. I won't delete it because we might need to reference it. So, okay, that's cleaned up everything quite a bit. This helix, this is what we need to bake. And actually, that's what we need to crash into somehow. We need to be applying forces to it. Now, before I was crashing this sphere into it, and crashing the sphere into it is valid, but that is not the limitation of what we can do, we could, for instance, and let's just see if this ends up working, which it might not. Actually, what we should do is just see how quick this runs, because now we've got all of these splines. Those are the only things that are actually dynamic. So if I'll just move the floor down so those don't move. Let's see how long it takes for those to fall to the ground. That's an important variable here. In fact, it could be so slow that I'm just going to hit one frame forward. Let's turn off that helix for a moment. One frame forward. One frame forward. Oh, there's no gravity, so I guess they won't fall. What's our playback speed? Uh, two frames a second. Not amazing, but you know, it's still technically we could work in the viewport on that. Um, let's select all of this. I would like to zero it out. Zero, zero, zero. All right. So, as I was saying, we have a really heavy friction on here. We could. Why uh, did that just jump? Reset PSR, and select all the points. Whoa. I think something about this dynamics tag doesn't like me moving them that way. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, OK, so here's a thought. Because I was saying we can collide into that with a sphere, why are those jumping around? 
Look at that. If I deselect it, it's saying that they're there. If I go to point mode, it's saying they're here. There's no tags on it. That's just a bug. I'm going to delete it. New file. Paste. Now it lives here. Where is it in the world? It is centered properly. Select all. It seems zeroed out, so new scene file seems to have fixed it. They'll cut it, go back to the scene file, paste it back in again. All right, now it's in the proper spot. Go figure. Um, anyway, what I was getting to. If we add the proper dynamics tag, and I would like to drag this one over, but I feel like that's what's going to make it jump. Well, let's just see what happens. Clear all caches. Um, okay, I'm going to try to make this point for a little bit now. If we start applying field forces at various times, then that might be able to give us all the motion. And if that is giving us the motion, we don't have to worry about the edges because those won't be getting over to that side. So to begin with, how powerful of a wind do we need for this to move at all? Creating a solid, you'll see that this is trying to push everything upward. So if that's pushing everything upward, right now it's pretty weak. If I go to 55, that's about the speed of like gravity. So let's see if that's enough for these splines to move. Keep in mind very slowly. And yes, that that is enough for them to all move. As soon as I turn off this field force, they should pretty much instantly stop um, because the friction is draining a lot of energy out. So they still collide with each other. If we take this field force and say, okay, yes, push upward, but creating a mask, I'd say, but don't push upward everywhere. Only push up where I have given you something to fall off. So dropping this in, this fall off is now the limited area that we're saying to push up. And given the animation we saw, that this covers it. So let's see if this indeed will push up. And we don't need to visualize that. It's just technically slowing us down. So hitting play. It restarts and oh, very good. You can see that this middle part is bulging up where we put that. It's a little slow. Um, I'll double the power. And that should push up for as long as we want it to. The main thing I'd love to see is those threads intersect with each other. Um, and we can definitely add noise in here so that this will get randomized. But let's just, I just want to give this a little bit of time, see what happens. Um, that we really killed the. Uh, the connections that they have between each other where it's like almost just literally deforming these. I kind of want to see the threads tugging a little bit. We can probably tweak a couple settings here. The main one being the structural. Um, if we put some more structure to them, about 100 is default, so we'll do 55. That's going to try and stop these from stretching. Um, and I would hope that we could see the energy is going to be draining a lot. Let's actually jump this to pretty high. 222. Two. Yeah, still not much effect. Uh, damping is the thing that we saw that it was actually having a much larger effect, but still not much of a change. Um, yeah, so it's just kind of deforming upward. Now, technically, they won't pass through each other. And we also need the splines, the spline dynamics here. I'm not sure if they can stop each other from passing through. But you do see we're getting this, you know, the bulge is pushing upward. Um, we can. Let's go back one frame forward so it actually resets. Let us add a random. Let's add some randomness on top of this. So that's all pushing upward. If I say, yes, make a random field, I want that to multiply on everything. That's just going to essentially zero it out. This is the direction. I don't know if that one cares about direction. This one just cares about power. I would like to multiply a noise, and this is the noise field. I would actually like to see a preview of it. I usually don't, but I would this time. How do I... Yeah, show me the plain preview. Oh, it's not going to show me. The one time I actually want to see it, it's not going to show me. How do I make it show? Eh, I don't know. Um, we're relatively large right now. Yeah, that's a cube. So let's do a thousand. A thousand on our scale. And that's already multiplying. So if I hit play, that should just start pushing up. It should start pushing up a little bit more randomly based on the size of this noise. Seeming a little large. I'm not seeing the individual ones. And also, it's so slow. I mean, even if this will eventually be the correct one. Maybe we do want it to be on the direction where we have to mask it out. But yeah, we don't want direction. Maybe that should go into the mask. 
Yeah, then that actually turns on, so that probably is what I had it had to do. Okay. Oh, also, I was going to crank up this wind strength to be even three times faster, just so this is going to be way too fast in our final animation, but it should give us a better playback right now. Um, let's see. So it looks like the noise is maybe really, really small. It's hard to tell. Do it again. Give me some of that randomness. There we go. I can see a little bit. Do you see how that one's up higher? This one's down lower. It's a little bit of chaos in this one now. Of course, the way the we the other weaves seem to be like stuck on the ground, but this is still something. I'm not trying to recreate what they had exactly. Um, and how are our threads tangling? Uh, I mean, honestly, they're not tangling that much, all things considered. Um, let's go easy on the friction. Easier on the friction, just so maybe everything can move a little bit more. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's some motion. You can see essentially what we were going for. I mean, well, actually... I know, I know I'm kind of all over the place on this one, but if this is just kind of tugging up here, but if we do punch a hole through this just with a sphere and we hide the sphere, that's good. That should tug the threads, right? So let's just, let's do that. Let's make a reasonably large sphere and then keyframe it. Keyframe. I don't want to take too long. Let's say 20 frames crash up through, push up pretty high. And then it can slink away into the darkness back down again. Okay. That should be fine. The field force is off. We just have friction. So that should crash into this. All of those are going to be getting yoinked up into the air. Let's go to an angle where we actually have light. Actually, let's change our display mode. And those are getting yoinked up into the air. They seem to be colliding with each other, but I think we need a little bit of thickness on those lines. And let's see what's a good thickness. If I create a sphere, I would like the line to be about that thick, which is um, radius of 24. That's a fine radius. I think we want half of that amount, and we might be subdivided too much for this to work. But let's go to the collision margin and put that a margin of half the amount of 12. And let's see if those suddenly explode. I'm going to pause immediately because I think they are exploding. And that means everything's going to be chugging as everything collides with everything. So I should escape out of that as quickly as possible. Because while this file is saved, I haven't saved it in a little bit. And it might just get stuck in this big old calculation. I thought 12 would be safe. Actually, yeah, like I said, the subdivisions. 12 would be fine if we're not subdivided, but I think there are subdivisions in there. Two of them. Okay. Yep. So everything seems to be exploding. Rewind. Um, we can go half the amount, and half the amount is super safe, but now we're only at three. Uh, how should we test this? Um, just for speed... Let's go one frame forward, one frame back, so it actually refreshes. Just to speed ourselves up, I'm going to select just these first two lines. Select uh, UW to select all those, UI to invert, delete, and now we can just see these. And I will undo back to that state. Actually, why don't we just copy that, undo, paste that, and that won't calculate. So we're just dealing with this one. So we should be getting much better frame rate. And, okay, those didn't explode. Double them. Okay, see, that's enough for those to push apart from each other. So that's essentially our maximum value, probably even a little smaller. But if I did want them not to explode at all, it's probably that this... Oh, it's a beast point set to adaptive. I don't want adaptive. Let's do uniform. Uniform 2. Yeah, that's fine. Let's go up to 12. Still not exploding. Let's go up to 24. Okay, 24 explodes, but... That is a very nice margin for us. Dropping down. Yeah, 17. Great number. Great number, 17. Um, copy that as a margin. Don't need that anymore. Bring back our giant one. Make sure we tell this to be a uniform subdivision of 2 and a margin of 17. 
Okay, that should give those a little bit of thickness so that they actually are going to react. Hit save, and now it's gonna take a bit to calculate, but let's see what this does. Do, do, do. Bunk. They get a little janky on the corners. Um, I don't think there's much friction, but I think we do actually see, look at the weave reacting. That's actually really nice. You see how that's pushing out from there? And you can see this nice tangle here that that is under, over, under, and it's not allowing it to unravel. That's that's really good. So, um, actually, this is all working quite well. The, yeah, actually, I mean, as a weave, I think that'll work. The only thing that we're getting, I guess, how do we do this? Um, I'm going to put a lot of damping on there. I want the structural to be strong. I don't want it to stretch. But I would like all these other threads to be reacting. So let's give that some, some power. So let's go back to 20%, 20%. Just see what that does. We're just experimenting with settings now. In fact, we have a lot of... We're going to zoom in on this. So let's just speed ourselves up by going to a top view, which somehow I rotated. Do, do, do. How do I unrotate when I'm in this POV? Let's go from let's go to the bottom view and then back to the top. Haha. -ha. Okay, select points, one frame forward, one frame back, just to force the refresh. I just want these points, maybe those points. UI delete. That should speed us up significantly. This is where the action's at. Okay, save again, hit play. Bunk. It is mostly bursting through, but this is a very loose weave, so that's not exactly surprising. Um, but yeah, I mean, it's not bad. They, they're they all kind of tangled. I am surprised that it's not forcing them to react a little bit further out. If it's not stretching, it's not sheer. We do have all that friction. Let's temporarily turn out the friction. I'm just curious. Do we get a little bit more of a reaction from everything? Because almost none. Oh, no, actually, yeah, you do see them pulling a little bit there. That's kind of fun. Um, so, yeah, let's just do that. We actually have a weave. It's actually getting punched up into the air. So let's see if we can actually copy our length of, uh, of hair onto those. So force a refresh, save can well here's here's always an interesting thing the spline wrap if we say yes spline wrap what are we wrapping along and i just say hey it's the connect then it is actually going to make a copy of every single one of those and make a full duplicate so in a way it's like the spline wrap is kind of like a cloner where it's now made a full copy of this weave on every single one of those now granted each one of those is identical so like that curve there is the same curve right there, I think. I guess it might be twisted differently, but they should be identical. Let's see how this looks uh, render-wise. And it, they're, they're very thin right now. And actually, is it not rendering? They're not rendering. Only the original is rendering. Is it, mm, is it not going to work if there's more than one? And also... Oh, they're supposed to be this. They clone onto the tracer, right? And the tracer should be connecting that. That might. Ew. Oh, that's connecting each one. That becomes a single weave too. Um, okay, let me think. There's going to be a good way to do this. I don't want to have to make a different copy for each segment it wouldn't be the worst thing if we had to do that but how do we and you let's just see if i turn this off and we hit render then yes that strand renders if we let's see let's turn this helix back on so we got a helix if we say okay spline wrap i want you to wrap onto the helix hit render yes that renders now let's say that this helix which doesn't need to be dynamic let's say that that is put into a connect object and i say okay clone onto that connect. Does that work? No, that's not acknowledging the helix if it's in a connector. But if I made it editable, it would. So having done that, let's make two helixes and I'll move one up into the air, then make that editable. And now you see it makes two copies of it. But if I hit render, it doesn't render it. So 
if this spline wrap is copying onto more than one segment, it can't see it. So we've just intentionally done a test to learn the limitations and the spline wrap while we are just saying it does that really cool thing where it kind of clones onto every single one. Obviously, that's creating a problem because it doesn't properly, it's not properly rendering anymore. And there's no way around it. If there's more than one segment, it doesn't like it. In this particular instance, something I think actually would work pretty well for us would be if I interconnect these, let's just join that segment and then join that segment. I don't think I can do them more than one at a time, but this will be relatively quick. So I'm going to turn this into a single spline. I don't think that was the right one. Here. Oh, this is going to be really tricky, actually. It won't take long if I do it correctly, but... Um, join segment. We could also... I guess... We could also explode these out and then make one instance per. That's not exactly fast. Uh, Lucas, we did a bunch of most spline stuff already. It does, did not work for us. Now these are, yeah, the sweep. We need to sweep along. And there's no way, the only way to get a sweep along is going to be this spline wrap. Is there any other way we could do it? It would be great if we could, but I don't think there is another like deformation that would do this for us. Hmm. How do we meticulously weld these? I mean, I could do that. And then we have to skip the next two. But then I yeah, see that's the yeah, I have to skip over one. That's the part that's going to trip me up and I'll definitely do it wrong. Definitely, definitely. Um, yeah, that's what I'm trying to do is weld endpoints. I'm just trying to think of a quick way of doing it. It's a little meticulous. Um, I mean, essentially, we have two options. Turn this into one spline so it'll actually acknowledge a single spline, and we'll probably have to rebuild this to be really long because it won't repeat. Or we explode this in the separate segments, and each segment gets its own spline wrap. Um, that one's a little more... I don't know. Honestly, I think it's going to be quicker than doing these all these exploding, but I hate having multiple rigs if we don't have to. Um, how, to what extent? It really sucks at the spline wrap. And it, what's really weird is that we see it. It's here, but it won't render it. <laughs> That's the goofy part. Um Think a do, think a think a do. Hmm. And from now on, I know we're spending like the entire episode on this. Um, from now on, in the future, if somebody asks a yarn question, everybody else in the chat can yell at them and be like, no, no yarn question. They always take forever. Um, yeah. Um, the quickest way for us to do this is going to be to weld them together. So in order for me to do this properly, I will just select the appropriate ones. I can say I'll interlink the close one. Okay, the pair that's close, the pair that's close, the pair that's close. Oh, it's gonna be easy to grab the wrong one. Yeah, I can't do the pair that's close. Ah! Sorry, this is just a very meticulous thing. I mean, I want to weld those two. Join. I mean, could I, if I just do every next one, does that create problems? Possibly.
but we already wasted enough time on this particular aspect of this question. Uh, and then we need their counterparts on the other end. So those two are already welded together, so I need one of them to jump to, I guess there, join. And then, well, let's see, I should be able to say UW, or yeah, UW, and those are all now technically connected, meaning I want to then weld those two together, join these two together, join, join, mm hmm, hmm. Those might already be joined. UW. No, that one's solo. Go away. I don't even like you. UW. Yes, they're all connected now. Okay. That was silly little extra something we had to do. Uh, that's not necessary. Now, the problem is that once the spline wrap turns on and we trace the tracer, and the tracer is tracing the whole thing, which is correct. Oh, wait, the tracer, the tracer is not seeing. Oh, that's actually fine. We just need the tracer to also have a B-spline subdivision. B-spline, uniform, two. And that should smooth those out, yeah. Or do we need that? I don't think we do actually. The tracer seems fine. It's just that you now see that the actual hairs that we're cloning along, like we this is we need it to have, have like that times many to make it work. So let's give that a save, and I don't expect it to run quickly. But let's try and bring this back. So double clicking recall. I've now gone back to the parametric version of everything, which is why we had saved it. And you see that we now have the individual hairs. So this helix needs to be at least 10 times as long, probably longer, but I'm gonna go with 10 times longer. If it's 10 times longer, that means it needs 10 times as many points. If it's got 10 times as many points, this is gonna be a mess. 10 times as many points, that means the hair needs 10 times as many hairs. Regrow, and now we get all those hairs. I would like to look at the reference again. I mean, it just seems like there's so many more. It seems like they're smaller. I would like to make this look nice, so when that, renders oh yeah it doesn't render until we make it editable because there's splines of course um, maybe I can make fewer segments and them not quite as long and I would like there to be more so I'll double the count and I would like them going both directions but uh, I'm not entirely sure what we'd have to do I'd probably have to reverse it um, Yeah, some people are talking about they'd like to see some redshift rendering for splines, which doesn't change anything here. We already, that, that's just something we can add on in the end. So we, we will spend some time there if people had been interested, which it seems like they are. All right, let's give this a save. And rebake this down. Um, I'm going to add another recall tag, and I'm going to say override. So this one is now saved for the long one. So now bake down the hairs, bake down those hairs. Um, oh, oh, geez, Louise, this is going to be insane. Um, oh, wait, no, there's no more hair, so it's going to be equally. We didn't make more hairs. We just made them longer. So it, we still got this really slow process where I have to delete this cloner that's containing a 1,000 or 2,000, like, effectors. But now that that's gone, that should, that should be running relatively quickly. Now, these could probably be combined into one, but I don't think that slows. Well, wouldn't hurt, so let's connect them connect and delete that becomes a single spline it has the appropriate hair material on there now the spline wrap gets locked to the tracer it even remembered that good job recall okay so now we have our hairs cloning even here you can see that there's still it's still not a great resolution we needed we needed those to have more 
We needed that to be at least twice as long. We doubled all those amounts, and it's still super duper long. Um, the uh, I would like to thicken it up a bit, so I think we could just scale it. So let's hit T for scale. Uh, let's turn off the spline wrap, and I'm just going to hit T for scale and scale this up. I would like those to eat up a lot more space. That could work. Yeah, so that just made them fatter. They're still the same resolution along because that didn't change, but they are fatter, which makes it look a little bit better. Uh, actually, that does, yeah, that does compensate in a good, big way. And it shouldn't repeat now because it is just one giant version of the pattern. All right, that was an awful lot of work to get us to this step. Hitting save. Uh, what's our refresh? I'm a little worried just hit play, but I think we can. Uh, we don't need to see the sphere. I mean, if we want to see it collide, we can, but especially like based on the reference, that wasn't really a thing. So let's hit play and see what kind of frame rate we get. I don't expect it to be great. Ah, about one frame. The uh, There's a lot of motion happening here. Why are those moving so much? We might need a like orientation for it, but we can see that starting to push upward and giving us a crazy shape. Let's see what that looks like rendered. Applying hair materials. Wow, there's a lot of uh, processing. Usually hair is like, boom, instant. Wow, I'm surprised at uh, the amount the hair is taking. Hmm. There it goes. Wow, that was a lot of calculation, but there it is. Uh, I feel like we need more fibers. We could double the thickness of those, but it is, is it going to take that long to render? Because I was going to send it out to the picture viewer. Um, well, let's just see. Um, thickness, uh, we'll double, because we made everything bigger, we can definitely double the thickness here. I feel like a little transparency would go a long way, but that's probably going to kill our render time as well. The, um, and then under illumination, adding more roughness. Um, translucence, shadow density. I would like to, let's set up a little bit of lighting, although with this many hairs, I don't know what it's going to do. But let's uh, make not crazy. Wow, I can't believe how much that slows everything down. And that's just the, the singular spline wrap is doing all of this because it's that's live. And it's too bad it's not caching it better. But let's give that a soft shadow. I'll make a second one. I'm not going to make a third. I would like to make a third, but I want it to render relatively quickly. Uh, and just to distinguish, we'll make one light a little bit warm. Come on. All right, I'll turn off the spline wrap. Make one light a little bit warm, one light a little bit blue. Pull that down a bit. Okay, let's frame this up to a reasonable angle. And I mean, I guess technically it'd be good to bulge up a corner like this so we could really crop into it, but this is what we made. Um, actually, I should be able to just render here. How far is the floor? Oh, wow, that, all that calculation isn't because of the spline wrap. It is just because of this freaking long hair um so it's gonna take that long just to get a single preview of this um how long did it take before 17 well i want i want to see how long it eventually takes yeah rblx this isn't even um uh, this isn't about hair dynamics anymore because that's not calculating this is just about a gigantic spline getting spline wrapped onto another spline hair's not a variable here hair's just our renderer um yeah not terrible the warm light's a little saturated um okay um now i mean what i want to do is send this to the picture viewer uh i am curious if the redshift is going to be able to handle this way better because it might um, but let's hit save. Um, 
And I guess let's set up, let's quickly set up some redshift. Actually, what's funny is redshift can just see the hairs really well out of the gate. So let's just see what happens if we do shift over to redshift. I'll immediately, for people who are covering me, or people who are supporting on Patreon, you get the scene files. So I'll make another scene file. I always do underscore RS for redshift. So we've got one pre-redshift. We'll leave the hairs, change this over to redshift. And I don't even think we have to change anything else, just the lighting perhaps. So we'll turn those lights off. And ba, ba, da, ba. and I'm, yeah, we still don't know why they were spinning around. That's another variable. But um, redshift area lights go up into the air. We also didn't do any kind of like specific scaling in the scene file. Um, I would like a animation target just target zero please and that's all fine make it a little warm and one more Yoop. we'll scoot that one over here make it a bit blue and a little less power all right without even turning on the spline wrap let's see if redshift can handle seeing this viewport Redshift render view. If I it suddenly disappear, it's because the renderer didn't like it. Um, keep in mind, this is the same computer that is live streaming, so we are asking a lot of it. Um, this seems to have claimed that it rendered, and yet I see nothing. There is no floor, but shouldn't the hairs have rendered? The hairs totally just render, do they not? Maybe they have to be active hair objects? I don't know. Well, let's not worry about that. Uh, okay, I'm going to be a little fuzzy on this, but let's make a redshift material. Actually, there's a redshift hair material. Um, but I kind of like making... Oh, I don't know if this will work. People can talk me through. Um, if we add a hair... Or if we go to add a redshift object tag go to curve add a curve so let's say hair strands but we have to do cylinders i think somebody is saying they wanted cylinders yeah cylinders to render spines you know we'll try cylinders why not um and then we just apply a redshift material and let's see if that shows up and also we're going to need a physical floor extracting geometry that is a lot of points Hey, it rendered something. Nice. All right, well, that gives us something. It already looks nice and fuzzy. Um, I would like a floor, so Redshift does not see the cinema floor. So I'll make one. And that can get its own plain Redshift material. Boop. And now, okay. So if we're rendering cylinders, I don't know if they all get interconnected, but can we randomize the color? Is that even an option? Let's zoom up on that thing. Um, we can't set an absolute color, but can we add color variation to it? In which case, and everybody who's been chatting for me to try this in Redshift, um, is it possible to do that using a color user data and specifically a, um, uh, a geometry ID color? Is that go? Would that work? I don't know. Diffuse color. Save. Turn on the renderer. It's again going to have to calculate all that geometry, but. Let's see. Allocating. I mean, well, okay, it's not random color, but it is quicker than all of the hair calculating. I'll give it that. Um, does the hair, yeah, I added the redshift octane tag. Um, does anybody know how you would add, how I could get random variation per spline here? Is that possible? Um, I don't know. And these are the cylinders. I, I, I do like the way redshift renders hairs. So I want to try changing this to hair strands. Um, it's doing something. 
Do, do, do. Okay, go. Allocating GPU. Okay, but well, now you see that they're super thin. It didn't change the color, though. Um, so, once again, nobody nobody's saying they know how to add random variation to the colors there. Now, it doesn't... Well, here's the thing is... I thought that I definitely was... I was rendering out an animation, and I was able to... Let me show you if I can. I rendered out an animation. I was actually working on this before the live stream. And... Let me see if I can pull this up without spoilers. Yeah, it's not perfect. But the point being is Redshift can just render cinema hairs, but maybe it can only do it when it's in hair mode. So this is not a final render, but you can see that uh, these are just cinema hairs and it's Redshift. And you see he was able to render them and there's variation in the color. So how... But these are these aren't hairs anymore. These are splines, so that could be the difference. Um, color user data is for MoGraph. No, I'm not using color user data. I'm using geometry. It's the geometry ID color. But those are all the same object, I suppose. So it doesn't see it per segment, which is always a thing. It's always a little. F it's probably a, a coding limitation to be incredibly slow. But there is no. Um, there's no way of exploding out the segments and doing it. Now, having said that, we could explode all these segments out, but then it's going to create a lot of hairs, like dangerously so. But just to show you, I bet you if I select just one, U, W, U, P. Oh, it's chugging. I should have stopped the renderer. Okay, let's just give it a second. It's suddenly trying to render the addition of a hair. Okay, so U, P, being the shortcut, that should take the singular spline I currently have selected and explode it into its own object. But it doesn't seem to be reacting. It's just a very complex object, so let's try clicking the button because it's not acknowledging my shortcut typing. Okay, now you see it exploded out to a separate object. And the original one still probably owns it. So I'll delete it in the original. So now I've got two and there is, now you see, I think there's one hair through there that gets its own color. So if we exploded all those separately, then they would be seeing them each as their own color. Unfortunately, that is asking too much of this. Now, if you wanted this to look a little bit nicer, um, color wise I am curious I do just want to steal the color off leave the hair material tag I don't think it's gonna work but let me just see if anything shows up because if that worked then it kind of just solves everything mm. no it's it's just acting as if there isn't a material um. So you could do cylinders if you do hairs and it is like a, a facing the camera angle, super thin thing. We could, we can't get variation in the color, which is the thing I was trying to really do there. But we could, of course, feed in a, we could say hair, I think we can say hair. Oh, hair position, right? Take the hair position, feed that through a ramp. And then output that as the color. Although, if this, <laughs> uh, I will do this, but that's not, even this isn't gonna work because it's, if it does apply, it's gonna be colorizing these hairs all the way along it, which means one side's gonna be totally black, the other side's gonna be white, but then all the little hairs that we added on are going to show the gradient very quickly. Um, yeah, so it's literally what it did. You see it's going from black to white, but it's going from black to 10,000 units away going to white. So yeah, we can technically do that. It could be fun. I'll even leave it on, but <laughs> you can observe there the limitation of it. Um, we could put different gradients and fall offs and whatnot. I'm going to have this go from, it's just going to fade from one color to another. So we'll go from kind of a dark green back to that teal that we'd been originally playing with. So just a little, we can add a couple in betweens, I guess. Add a blue, add green, 
and a little bit extra there. Distribute knots, and you know, just a little bit of color variation. Why not? And let's see. There's a random hair color node. Well, I'll try. I'll check that out, David. Uh, I'm not typically checking Slack when the live stream's going. So try just type type out the things in the chat, and I'm kind of keeping an eye on the, on the chats. Um, anyway, just uh, David pointed out that there might be oh in here there might be a hair a random hair node, but I don't know if that's going to do anything. Let's say. Oh, that's the material node. In here, let's search for the word hair again. We do have random hair color, but this is just a guess. We'll throw that directly in here. Is there any controls? Mm, just a color and then the hue amount, presumably hair variation. I'll crank that up all the way. We'll see if that does anything. If that works, that'll be great. Hey, it does. Look at that. We got different hair colors. All right. Thanks, David. That actually helps a lot. Uh, it's a little dark, but this is a dark color. So we'll crank that. Teal. And we'll go a little easier on the color variation. And excellent. Now we could add a little bit of fuzziness. We, they could like fade out in the end and whatnot, but that's fine. Um, and then do we want those to be thicker? Maybe. Let's do 1.5, why not? Okay, let's see if that's gonna be a little bit brighter. The lighting is actually quite dim. I guess these are decently far away. Um, render. Probably should have thrown HDR in here. Because they are shiny, technically. Redshift does get to the point a lot quicker. Yeah, okay, that works really quickly and nicely. Now, it's also, everything will potentially slow us down, but we could do, let me throw an HDR in here, because why not? Don't render. Save. All right, we're making progress. Um, Redshift, lights, dome light, and I've got a couple HDRA Haven HDRs. So I'll just go up to... Um, episodes, textures, HDRs. Um, there's a daytime scene, and then it's the factory scene. Um, this is the factory scene from the um, vacuum forming tutorial. So we'll put that in, that'll put in the background. I'll even give it a little extra exposure. And, okay, having done that, let's just see what that looks like. Make sure that the HDR comes through. We don't have any GI turned on. We should turn on some GI, although it will slow us down. Yeah, well, okay, the floor is super shiny, but now you see we get the shine on there, which is cool. So now we can go into this actual material and we make that a little bit rougher. Here's the shininess. I don't mind the shininess, but let's roughen that up. And then can we, yeah, backlight. I wanna add some backlight in here. So the backlight, let's just do full backlight. Why not? Because the, the, well, maybe not quite all the way, uh, quite a bit though. And then I would like to expose this color and the same color come out from there. This is saturation. Amount. I'm gonna crank the saturation up more. I want those to be like really bright uh, and a little extra variation. Why not? Uh, the shiny floor is bugging me. Uh, the floor honestly doesn't need to be reflective at all. I'll just, it's on the other screen. I'm just going to say zero reflection. Okay, there we go. Some more variation. Uh, now they should have a backlight to them, which is, it's kind of, in a lot of ways, kind of like a very simple subsurface scattering. Yeah, well, it's softer anyway. The shininess, yeah, I, I see that transparency feels pretty nice. Um, now it is redshift, so can we add a little bit of transparency to this sucker just to have them blend in? Let's say, yeah, it's still running live. Transparency, a uh, decent amount, we'll say that. Just to get, yeah, oh, look how soft that makes that feel immediately. There's such a nice softness to that. 
And then we've got that reflection. I'm going to blur. Oh, yeah. Look, blurring that reflection. Look how soft that's starting to look. Um, let's give a little bit of color to the reflection just to keep the saturation up a bit more. The hair color. Crank that more. I want like as much color as I can get out of that thing. Um, the um, Let's see. What is there anything else we can do here? Like that's yeah, this is definitely just how shiny those are going to be. And I don't think we want them to be terribly shiny. Um, let me think. Uh, I think I might just want to thicken them up a little bit more. Save. Let's go up to two. It's going to reallocate, so let's give that a second. There we go. Yeah, thicker. That just fills it up. Okay. That is... Oh, and we could... Well, if we taper that down, it's going to get really... Keep in mind that we have... Maybe we shouldn't have merged the hairs with the long one because we could have applied different materials to them because these could be, like, getting skinnier maybe as they go. But, you know, I think that's as good as we're going to get here. So let's attempt to apply this to our overall thing and maybe even render it out because Redshift is rendering a lot quicker. So... Uh, let's frame up, and uh, I'm scared, but I'm just going to do it. Let's hit spline wrap. That gets applied everywhere, and let's set up the renderer. I'm going to keep all these settings crazy low. We're going to not save output all frames. Let's render it square 540 just because it's a live stream. We don't have too long to wait. There we go, focus in on the interesting part. Um, yeah, we'll allow that to go for as long as it needs to. Redshift, it's got all these defaults. I mean, we could turn on GI, which is gonna make it look even softer. It's gonna slow us down, maybe not like a, a ton, but it'll slow us down a bit. Uh, and we could increase this as well, but let's just say, see how it looks in a couple of, st or in the first frame, and if it looks terrible, then we'll crank it up. And let's see how long that's taking. And I think everything else is set up and ready to go. So cross your fingers. I did just save it. So even if it crashes, it should be fine. Keep in mind that we did see it spinning before, and we haven't done anything to solve that. So these might be twirling around all crazy-like, and I'm not sure what the fix for that would be. But we'll find out. Ooh, those look muddy. Um, I mean, the HDR is kind of muddy, but I would want to, I mean, there's no, it doesn't look soft. It looks more spiky. Um, we could turn one of our specific lights back on. Uh, we could add more transparency to them. So that's more of the bundling that makes them look nice. I think that'd be a good idea. The, uh, we can still add more hue variation. Um, yeah, I'll do that, and then we'll. I'll see if there's any like questions I can answer while it's rendering. Um, so, I would like to. I mean, I want everything to be soft. Let's add as much transparency or backlighting as we can. There's even the sheen. I don't know what sheen does. I don't want to just throw it in there, me not knowing what it is. I'm gonna add quite a bit of transparency to them, so any one thread isn't gonna be that thick. But as you see through through multiples, we will see it. Um, and then just because it does look a little bit muddy overall, I'm going to turn back on our bright, uh, bright light. Maybe not at the maximum brightness. And that's all I think we can afford right now. Honestly, I don't even think we need this floor. The floor isn't technically doing anything so let's not worry about the floor just seeing that background is going to look better than the big gray floor sheen was added to make fabric look more realistic sheen was only a few months old uh, yeah i don't know what it would do for our threads here but 
And then even throwing that out there, I mean, we'd probably want there to be like 10 times as many threads. But I do like, I mean, we spent the time. We got 100 different threads. They're all completely random. Um, ooh, that looks better already. A more distinct light and that little bit of transparency already looks like fuzzier and softer. Now, I do think that we want, would want these little fuzzy strands. We'd want like 10 times as many, but a bunch of them to be a lot shorter. And like I said, I expect this to be twitchy. It's probably going to be randomly spinning around. Um, I'd have to think about why that might be. Nothing's immediately coming to me. And there's not much we're going to be able to do here except let this chug away. It's not slow, but it's not like the speediest thing right now because we're throwing a, you know, a lot of splines at it. Um, but I do wonder if Sheen would make this look nicer because it is kind of a fabric. It is fibers. Um, so yeah, that could potentially do something. Uh, more useful for a macro cloth render, not close-ups. Um, yeah, Zach, potentially we need some sort of rail spline, but this is the type of setup where rail splines are pretty much nonsensical. Um, there's a thing that comes with something like the spline wrap. Well, there's a couple things. We could, the spline wrap has something called rotation, the up vector. And if we gave Y positive an up vector, that actually might solve some of the problem. Even right there, you can see that starting to spin. Uh, if we give that an up vector, that actually might go a long way. Um, and then, I guess these are pre-spun already, but we didn't, we made them 10 times longer, but didn't spin them anymore um, when we baked it down, I think. So let's try, let's try spinning. That's a good trick. Let's spin another thousand percent. And we have an experimental Y up vector. And I mean, okay, I, if we can't keep restarting this because we're never going to see any motion. Um, and it's already taking like a minute to get two frames, more than a minute to get two frames. Okay, um, do we have any questions that I can answer? Um, if we're using an HDR, do we have to turn on GI? Actually, that's a very good point. Maybe when I didn't turn on GI, the HDR was doing nothing but reflections. So that's why everything suddenly looked a lot better when I turned a light on, because suddenly there was something to illuminate. Um, but I didn't want to turn GI on because I could take a while to render. Um, now, nothing looks like it got messed up. They, if anything, they look... I wonder if I twisted the wrong direction. I feel like I might have... I think I counter-twisted them. So, like, the twist we had before and the twist I'm doing now are opposites, which is kind of funny. But let's do a negative. Can we go negative? Yeah, we have negative. I'm just going to restart it. I know I keep saying we can't keep restarting it, but I want to keep... We spent this much time. Let's see if we can get a decent-looking end result. Um, yeah, yeah, that's what we're talking about, Crossfader, that they recently added Sheen as a redshift shader attribute, but I don't know much about it. Um, yeah, random hair color, that is great. Oh, yeah, they've been there. Um, freeze the geo. Um, Jason, I'm, I, I'm not like a redshift expert, so the idea of freezing the geo in redshift is not a concept I'm familiar with. Doesn't look that much more fuzzy, or spun. I guess spinning it a thousand or spinning it three hundred and sixty ten times is not that much when it comes to something this long. So we probably wanted an extra zero there. I am not restarting. Um, doo -doo -doo. Yeah, those are older questions. So anybody has a typed out question, um, or even a link, but something that we don't need to be interacting directly with Cinema that I can possibly answer does look like we're still spinning they are actively spinning and there's nothing even happening right now i guess the entire thing's moving down but why would it be spinning i don't know that'd be something we'd have to isolate and experiment by itself but i just want to see if we can get that thing to start poking up a little bit through if it does anything for us um do 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 scrolling back up through the chat Yes, Fear Factory, we have not tackled a really long singular question all season. Um, let's see, Crossfader is asking about collider joints. I don't even know what that means. Oh, no, is that what I thought it was? 
Yeah, somebody's got a tool that they're working on. Um, let me shrink this small. Um, but you're saying, do I know about collider joints and yeah, I don't, uh, I, I don't, I don't have anything here. If I were to do something here, it would be building a dynamic approximation of it and then applying it. But I think this is like a completely separate tool that somebody's working on. Um, so yeah, there's not much to talk about there, sadly. I would, you know, I have a SIGGRAPH presentation that I did. Let me see if I can actually track it down because it was a really good one. Do, do, do. Um, how do I find this? I want a new tab. And then let's search for, I think it was SIGGRAPH. SIGGRAPH, Maxom, Chris, Schmitz, um, Dynamic rigging? Not the ragdoll dynamics, although the ragdoll dynamics were cool. Maybe it was maybe it was NAP. NAP. That didn't change the search results at all. I remember that one. I remember that one. But where's the squids? The dynamic squids. Maybe it was this one. I don't remember. I think they made a custom thumbnail for me. Hey. Do, 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 do. No, no, this is this is later. This is a good presentation. I like it though. Smash. View all. Yeah, maybe. Hmm. I don't know. The, the one I'm looking for is a little older than the ones I see popping up here. Maybe dynamic rigging. I don't know. Stylistically speaking, it feels more like it'd be a SIGGRAPH one. But it's not doing a great job of searching for them, so I'd have to search separately. If anybody knows where it is, that'd be great. But that's not a big one. Uh, okay, we're eight frames in. Eight frames. And we are slightly spinning. Not as much as I thought. It's coherent, but it is spinning. Twitch, 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 twitch. Um, Oop, it's starting to form already, which is good. At least we don't have to wait too long for that. Um, Oliver's asking if it was a half res talk. No, it was definitely a Maxon talk with a bunch of a bunch of dynamic squids. But let's see. What's going on? Uh, Mick is asking what's going on with the Windbush vid. Uh, I'm not sure what you mean. Like the... Uh, it's live now. It only went live today, so you can head on over to my channel, which I've lost the window. Oh, here. Aha. Uh, yeah, here it is. So for Mick, here's the link to that. Um, yep, went uh, live today, unless you mean there's some problem specifically with it. Uh, it might be the one with the trees, Leo. At the end of the one with the trees, do I have a bunch of squids falling into a bucket? Mm. Ark is asking, trying to make the blood on a character's hands with C4D RealFlow plugin. Oh yeah, I don't know anything about the real. Fl I don't know anything about RealFlow. It's always been a big thing. Um, let's see. Uh, Oliver found a link. Let's see. <gasps> Squids. Look, it's even the thumbnail. Ha ha. Blah, 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 blah. Yeah, so this is this is as far as I go. 
um, all about like creating a dynamic rig with connectors and then eventually running those connectors through joints so then you can like rig something up entirely you see this is the dynamic version of the squid and then i make a joint that represents every single one of those and then i match the hierarchies possibly with a pose morph you could do it with a pose morph if you built them identically but there's a good chance i did it with a series of constraint tags it didn't actually take that long because you'd only have to make one and copy it over a bunch of times um and then you get a fully dynamic and i think i even put springs there's even springs on this so um they they want to stay straight and they don't want to twist in unnatural ways you see how they're trying to like return a little bit but you get this fully dynamic character and you know of course uh, re yeah any you can even interact with them in the viewport which is pretty fun and then i just ran that through joints into a character and then you end up with a whole bucket of squids blah 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 blah, blah. Oh, and then I put a big turbulence in, which makes them kind of crawl around, which is fun. Um, yeah, that's that's a thing. I'll put that link in YouTube just in case anybody's curious, because it was already in the Twitch chat. Do I always use the vanilla cinema setup? Uh, yeah, I always use vanilla cinema setup because if I don't use vanilla, I teach in cinema and that's one of the main things I'm doing is teaching with cinema. And if I ever significantly change my interface, then it's just confusing for people watching tutorials. There's quite a few times where I'll you know, like be looking up something for any piece of software and people have customized their layout so much that I'm like, okay, it's so much harder to follow now. So my motivation is keeping it vanilla so that other people can follow along more easily. Let's see what we got here. Ba -ding. Stretch, stretch. I suppose because of the way they're getting spline wrapped that it's just remapping and they're all stretching, but there's no movement happening in the beginning. I guess I'll move down. I mean, it's working. They're, you know, it is tangled up. They are maintaining that shape. There's a lot of things that could be changed, but oh, and then it's spinning is bugging me. We'd have to look into that separately. Um, but let's see, we're already 20 minutes over, but is there any, is there any other questions we can even, you know, it's not just a typed question, but a question to tackle in cinema. I know that there's a bunch from way, 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 way back. Uh, next week we'll have Nick Campbell on as a guest, which is exciting. That should be good. And of course we'll be tackling more questions along those lines more individual questions uh, dean is going to ask every week if the there's a preview for the new plugin the new the next plugin from rocket lasso is going into beta hopefully later this week or very early next week but i don't really show too much in the way of previews off before we have stuff ready because the bad part is is if i show off any parts of a new plugin and people are like oh i need that right now for a project then I can't give it to them. Like it's not ready. It's not compiled for all the versions. There's going to be bugs. There's going to be um, like notation. It's not sealed up. So I can't give it to people. So then it's just creating frustration for everybody. And it's not good for my own mental health to have a bunch of people being like, I want that now. I want that now. And I can't give it to them. So that's not a thing. Um, dynamic magnet rig. That's a neat question. Um, I'm kind of scared. I mean, this isn't going to change much from right now. I got to figure out that spin. If I do think about, if I do figure out a way of controlling the spin, we'll do a follow up at some point. Uh, and because this was so involved, I don't see a tutorial coming from this one. Bloop, bloop, bloop. Oh, actually, speaking of tutorial, I, here's a thing I should have pulled up already to show off. But I was, I had a friend ask a question the other day, and about, um, I guess I can just open up the scene file. But I, I think the next tutorial will be this. C4D, uh, balloon, okay. So, yeah, I mean, I don't see any reason to keep this rendering right now. Well, let's just take a look at it in real time. Blurp, blurp, blurp. There's definitely something kind of magic, there's something special missing from it. I have to think about it, but it is a 
woven layout. It is getting, it is able to get deformed. It's a little limited in, in what it's doing, but at least they don't pass through each other. I'm gonna stop that render for now. I'll probably, I might tinker with it a little bit, but there's other things I have to do as well. Give that a second to wake up. And then you're asking about, um, Oliver, can you be more specific when you say dynamic magnet rig? What would you, what would be more specific? Because just a magnet is probably relatively straightforward. Um, <laughs> Quack, that's a crazy idea. A plugin that would trigger like music um, when collisions. I mean, right now you can just do that with Expresso. You could make certain sounds get triggered when it is. I built an entire pinball machine based on that idea. Um, I have not ever simulated electric current flow, no. Um, but yeah, uh, what you mean with dynamic magnet rig, I'd be curious, but I'd need more specifics. But anyway, I wanted to pop this open. And I had a friend ask me about making balloons and then I end up going way overboard and making fully dynamic balloons. And so these balloons are, these are actually dynamic strings and this is running in real, well, not real time, but you know, eight frames per second in the viewport. Um, and what's cool is keep an eye on this box. That's also a dynamic box that weighs something. So if that pulls up, if these balloons pull up enough, it actually will yank on the box, um, which is, pretty fun by itself and then I uh, this is as f I pushed it this far this took well this was like six hours of rendering but this is 800 balloons and as I said fully dynamic the balloons are pulling up and that's a really heavy box and you see how many strings that there are but it's it's actually incredibly stable like it, it's super coherent in the way it moves there's some turbulences that are pushing it around and the whole thing gets yanked up. So kind of just building it for real, it's pretty fun. So that might become the next tutorial. I had a lot of fun putting it together and honestly, it's not that complicated. Conceptually speaking, it's one of the more simple things. The new tutorial that's coming out uh, maybe next week. Well, it definitely won't be next week. It'll be next week for Patreon. So if you're following on Patreon, you'll get a tutorial early. Um, but yeah, I really love these balloons. Um, also rendered in Redshift. Um, but just to show you, let's see, does this one have it? Yeah, the field force. If I, I'm going to increase the power of this field force. And there's now a wind that is, let's see, I don't know how they're connected, so it may or may not work. Uh, the way they're connected is not working. So if I change this to be a fixed connector, it should work. Okay, so I've got a field force that's creating a spin motion. And that spin motion, well, okay, it's freaking out a little bit. Maybe making that one fixed wasn't a great idea. Well, that just goes to show the uh, importance of <laughs> the entire rig working properly because that one little tweak just broke it. Um, I guess weren't I had like an easy go-to one that was, oh, that's not gonna run quickly. Yeah, this is when it started getting too fancy, or too fancy to show in real time. But one of the early ones was set up to have the field force twisted around. Yeah, maybe this one. Yeah, yeah, okay, so look at the, because it's, these are actually dynamic strings, because it's spinning around, look at them actually twist up on each other. Like they're actually wrapping and getting tangled. And then what's really cool is if I just turn off the field force that's creating that spin motion, I'm just going to turn it off right now in the viewport. So they have motion. They have inertia. So they're going to slow down. And then they will slow down. And there's no wind anymore. There's no wind telling them to spin one way or the other. But because of the natural way that they're twisted up, just like in real life, they're going to naturally unspin themselves because of the way they're twisted. So that's, that's where you get the advantage of. If you actually build these things for real, then they start behaving like real life. Um, and yeah, you can see them all start spinning back the other way unmotivated except for the fact that they're twisted this way pretty cool i really like that stuff i like it i like those questions <laughs> yeah br brother zach saying uh we could have made yarn from those strings um you're not wrong 
but there's certainly limitations. Everything has its limitations. But yeah, RBLX, that will be a tutorial. I guarantee it because it's just too much fun not to make it a tutorial. Um, and it was a good excuse to do some more Redshift as well. Um, let's see. We're not really getting much in the way. I know there's a lot of questions early on, but we're already a half hour over. Maxon's got a show going. Um, and uh, yeah, R2, R2R. Yes, I don't have any Redshift. I don't have any Grayscale Gorilla plugins installed here because I don't have plus and I, as far as I know so I have it in older versions of cinema I just don't have it in R23 um, but let's see anything else yet tutorial FPS oh yeah and uh, yeah David yeah it does those balloons do have pretty decent FPS as long as you keep the number down if you've got like 30 40 balloons it's pretty reasonable you go to 800 not as reasonable but it does work um Let's see. Um, yeah, I guess that's going to wrap it up. Um, yeah, we covered a bunch of stuff. I guess at this point, it is important to note that everybody should head on over to rocketlasso.com, go to the community page, and join the Rocket Lasso Slack channel, where a bunch of the people who have been hanging out in the chat, both on YouTube and Twitch, hang out. And they do challenges and contests. Oh, wait, there is one more thing I wanted to show. Here's a little preview of the next tutorial that's coming out. That's the next, next tutorial. But the actual next one, I finally got recorded. Um, let me open this up. Here's the end result of the tutorial. So here's the one. I recorded this tutorial yesterday. I'll be editing it this week. But it is a tutorial to be able to get some really nice paper peeling going. You see how that's getting erased out. And it's a whole, it's a MoGraph rig. So you could build it to like unravel or build on. And it's all about like getting variation in there, making it very controllable and being able to art direct it. Like in this case, I had them shrink down to nothing, but you don't have to do that either. So it's just a lot of possibilities. But yeah, I think it's a really good tutorial. So I'll be editing that and that will be available on Patreon probably on Tuesday. That's the plan to get that posted on Patreon on Tuesday and it'll be available publicly a week after that. Um, and yeah, head over to Rocket Lasso. Actually, here's a link to the Rocket Lasso community page. Head on over there and join the Slack channel. This poster was actually created by a Tobias in the Slack channel during one of the weekly sketches where they were making like movie posters. And so there's lots of cool challenges like that. Um, and as always, I guess I'll throw this out there. Why not? Um, do do do. If you like this content, if you want access to these scene files, if you want access to bonus live streams every Tuesday and Thursday, I do have a Patreon set up. And if you want to head over there, that would be appreciated. But of course, I just enjoy doing this. It's good challenges. It gives me inspiration for tutorials. Um, yeah, really fun overall. Everybody should head on over right now to C4D Live. And I think there's probably still presenting. Uh, that stuff is always cool. Yeah, next week's guest is Nick Campbell. Um, and that should, that should be everything. Um, thank you so much, everybody. This was fun, as always. Um, I haven't decided on tomorrow's bonus stream, but we'll talk about th that tomorrow. Uh, okay, everybody, goodbye. Thank you so much, and I'll see you next week.